I'm going to be going over a number of AP Biology grid in questions. The first one gives us information about a population in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. So we're going to be using the two Hardy Weinberg equations to solve this. Uh, it's a, a problem about individuals who can taste or not taste a particular substance. Uh, we are told that the allele for non tasters is recessive, and that's important because with Hardy Weinberg problems, you are starting with the recessive population because if you know that somebody is expressing the allele, the dominant allele, you don't know whether that's homozygous dominant or if that's a heterozygous individual. So you have to begin with the recessive. The equations that we're dealing with is p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1 p plus q equals 1. So p squared represents the homozygous dominant individuals. 2pq is heterozygous. And q squared is homozygous recessive. And these different values are actually the fraction of that population. So you're going to be getting, uh, you know, something between 0 and 1. Uh, and so to begin this problem, we're going to be looking at q squared because we know something about the homozygous recessive individuals. We know that they are non-tasters. And so what we can do is take a look at the population here. We have 8,235 tasters, 4,328 non-tasters. That adds up to a total of one total of 12,563 individuals and therefore to get the fraction of the population that is a non-taster we'd look at 4,328 divided by the total population which is 12,563 and when we do that we get a fraction of about 0.34 just rounding there 0.34 so that's actually going to be my q squared. So I'm going to plug that in as q squared. Now because I've figured out q squared, I can't solve for p yet. It's too much math involved there. So what I'm going to do is, is instead take q squared and get q. And exactly as the math implies, you just take the square root of that. So the square root of 0.34 is going to be 0.58. So I get a Q value of 0.58. Okay, so this is now Q. Now if that's Q, I plug 0.58 in here, then P, this needs to add up to 1, P is going to be um, 0.42. Okay. Now to take a second and remind ourselves what we're actually trying to solve for, the question here is asking for how many of the tasters are heterozygous for tasting. So basically we're worried about this 2pq part, but now that I know what p is and I know what q is, I can actually solve for 2pq. So if I do 2 times p, which is 0.42, times q, which is 0.58, and I multiply all that together, I end up with 0.4. And what that tells me is that 0.49 of the population, or a fraction of 0.49 of the population, is going to be heterozygous for this. So if I take that 0.49 and multiply it by the total population, which is at 12,563, um, 0.49 times 12,563, that's going to give me the individuals that are heterozygous, and I get an answer of 6,156. And I did some rounding there because fractions of people don't really work out. Okay, so I get 6,156. Box around that. Um, now, this problem didn't actually specify what we're rounding to, so I'll just round to a whole number. It's asking for individuals that make sense. second problem about snapdragons actually just involves a simple Punnett square. So what we're looking at here is we have a uh, flower color and we have two different alleles, a capital R for red and a capital W for white. Heterozygous individuals have pink flowers. So it tells us that two pink individuals are crossed. So I'm going to do RW, 
or W, and set up my Punnett square. And I'm going to end up with R, 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 W, R, W, and W, W. OK, so now going back to this, uh, it says calculate how many of the offspring uh, out of this 465 is expected to have the red phenotype uh, round your response to the nearest whole number. So the red phenotype is going to be um, homozygous dominant for the red allele, which will be um, one-fourth of this population then, and one-fourth of 465. I end up with 116.25. It tells me to round to the nearest whole number. That makes sense. I'm going to round to 116 uh, individuals then for the red phenotype. In this next problem, we're going to be looking at a simple Punnett square again, this time bringing in chi-square analysis based on our expectations for what we should find versus what we actually do. And uh, so we're looking at corn. We have purple corn kernels and yellow kernels. A student counts 329 purple, 299 yellow, and uh, we're supposed to calculate the chi-square value uh, for the null hypothesis that the purple parent was heterozygous for purple kernels. So to set this up, uh, what we are assuming here is uh, because we have a cross of a purple and a yellow, if the purple parent was heterozygous, then what we're looking at is them contributing a capital R, lowercase r, while the yellow we know is going to be contributing to lowercase r's, and so we end up with uh, this distribution being expected. Basically what that tells us is we're expecting 50% uh, purple, these two, and 50% yellow. So out of a total of 628 kernels, that's 329 plus 299, we have uh, 628 total, so we're expecting half of those to be uh, purple and half to be yellow. So the expected is uh, purple, 314, and yellow, 314. Now the observed was purple, 329, and yellow. 299. So now we're ready to actually do the chi-square, and chi-square is equal to the sum of observed minus expected quantity squared over expected. So I'm going to do that for both the purple and the yellow, and uh, because of this here, it is the sum of those two different calculations. So when I do this for the purple, I get um, observed, which is 329 minus 314 squared over 314, which is equal to 0.72. And then for the yellow, I similarly do 299, which would be minus. And that quantity squared over 314. And the difference between 329 and 314 and 299 and 314 is actually the same, so I end up with the same number of 0.72. Um, Chi-squared is, is a sum of those, and so my chi-square value here is going to be 1.44. And it wants my answer to the nearest tenth, so it's going to be 1.4 got to be careful of uh, specifically what they ask for. Typically, it's going to be uh, kind of what you expect the number of decimals to be, but depending on how you're calculating things, it may end up being different than what you get, and so you just got to be careful. Um, it doesn't ask in this problem. It will in later ones, but basically we would then look at the chi-square table here to determine whether or not we uh, reject our hypothesis or fail to reject our hypothesis. In this case, uh, the number of degrees of freedom would be 1, and the reason is because basically it's your number of outcomes minus 1. So we had two different outcomes, purple or yellow, minus 1. Uh, gives us a degree of freedom of 1. And looking at the 1.4 value there, we find ourselves uh, somewhere in this range, which is in the uh, acceptable range. So um, what that means is we accept our hypothesis, or rather we fail to reject the null hypothesis. 
uh, and reminding us what is the null hypothesis. Well, the null hypothesis was that the purple parent was heterozygous. And so we don't have sufficient information to, to uh, say that that's not the case. And in fact, the observation here was pretty close to 50-50, so it's most likely that the, the purple parent was heterozygous. In number four, we have another pretty simple Punnett square to do. However, this one does have a small trick to it. So here we're looking at a dog breed known as the Mexican hairless, um, which is sounds pretty terrible. Homozygous recessive individuals, uh, lowercase h, lowercase h, display a coded phenotype having two capital H's. The homozygous dominant is lethal during embryonic development. Um, now they don't give us any more information there, but what we can uh, what we can pull out of that is that then the uh, hairless phenotype must come from uh, heterozygous. So uh, basically in a cross between two dogs with this hairless phenotype, which would be H, capital H, lowercase h, capital H, lowercase h, we end up with uh, this one, which is going to die because it's lethal. We end up with a heterozygous, heterozygous, and a homozygous recessive, which is going to be the coded phenotype. So here's where the kind of trickiness comes up with this question. It says, in a cross between two dogs with the hairless phenotype, what proportion of puppies born is expected to be hairless? Give your answer in the form of a fraction. So in this case, when you first look at the Punnett square, you would say, oh, hairless is going to be uh, two-fourths or one-half because we end up with only two heterozygous out of four possible choices. However, this one here is lethal during embryonic development, which means that that will not be a puppy that is born, and therefore the fraction of the born puppies that will be hairless is actually two-thirds, because we have two heterozygous out of three possible uh, surviving combinations. So we get two-thirds would be our answer there. And on the fill-in, you would do two slash three, because it asks specifically for the answer in the form of a fraction. Any other way of representing that number would not be okay. In number six, we're going to be doing a dihybrid cross to solve for a chi-square value in the end. So before we can solve the chi-square value, we have to know what our expectations were, what we expected the numbers to be, and then we can compare those to the given observed. Reading through this, what we figure out is that bitter and non-explosive, these are the two different traits, so it's, it's bitter or non-bitter and non-explosive or explosive for watermelons. I don't know why watermelons are exploding, but I guess that's a thing. So looking down this list, um, the bitter is a dominant allele. Same thing with non-explosive, uh, uh, or dominant trait, rather. Um, so this would be dominant and recessive. This is recessive, non-bitter, and dominant. And this is recessive, recessive. Um, now that's typically how we write it, right, from, from having both traits being dominant to both traits being recessive. But it's good to double check. Uh, the total number of watermelons that were produced here is 299, because 300 would have been just too easy and even. And uh, so now we have to figure out what our expected are. This is the part that's kind of a pain. We actually have to do the dihybrid cross. So the cross that's going to be performed here is, is between a heterozygous individual for both traits and a homozygous recessive individual. So the heterozygous individual is going to have um, a capital SU, lowercase SU, and a capital E, lowercase e, because they have one allele for the dominant and recessive. Uh, they have one dominant and one recessive allele for both of these traits. The recessive individual is going to be lowercase SU, lowercase SU, lowercase e, lowercase e, because they only have recessive alleles. Now, ordinarily a dihybrid cross is going to yield a 4x4 four four square and is a little bit more complicated to figure out the exact proportion of each possible combination of alleles. In this case, however, because we have a homozygous recessive individual for both alleles, it's only possible for that individual to give us a lowercase su and an e. Um, so the heterozygous individual, though, still has four different possibilities of what they could contribute. So we have um, dominant SU for the bitter and a dominant allele for the explosiveness, uh, which is actually non-explosive, and a 
dominant and recessive for explosive, or we can have recessive for bitterness, dominant for non-explosiveness, or we can have recessive, recessive. So there are four different possible outcomes depending on uh, which combination of alleles is contributed by the heterozygous individual. So to figure out then what those are going to be, I do uh, capital SU, lowercase SU, capital E, lowercase E, capital SU, lowercase SU, little e, little e, lowercase SU, lowercase SU, big E, little e, and all small. So we only have uh, four different outcomes. Now, as it turns out, these are in the same order. So we've got bitter here because dominant SU and non-explosive because dominant E here. We have bitter because dominant SU and explosive because we are uh, homozygous recessive for explosiveness here. Um, non-bitter and non-explosive and non-bitter and explosive. So these line up here. What this tells me is that my expected values for these, or my expected breakdown between these different possibilities is one-fourth chance for each one. So my observed values are given. My expected would just be one-fourth of the uh, total, which was 299, which I'm going to round to be 75 for each one. So I'm expecting 75 for each of these, 75, 75, 75. 75. So now we're ready to do our actual chi-square because to do an, a chi-square you have to be able to take your observed and your expected and compare them against each other. So again the equation for chi-squared is the sum of your observed minus expected, that quantity squared over expected. And I'm going to do this four times for each of these. So I'll set up one and then I'm just going to give the values for the others. But it's going to be, let's see, for the first one, 88 minus 75 over 75, and I gotta square the numerator there. And uh, when I do that, I get 2.3. So this one, 2.3. When I do this for the others, I end up with the following values. I get 0.65 for the second one, I get 2.3 again for the third, and I end up with um, 0.48 for the last one. And chi-squared is a sum of those values, so I'm going to add those up, and when I do that, I get a chi-square value for this problem of 5.73. And before I can go over to my chi-square chart, I need to think about my degrees of freedom. And my degrees of freedom, in this case, is the number of possible outcomes, of which there are four, minus one, which is three. So now looking at this chart, in the bottom, I have a chi-square value of 5.73. My degrees of freedom are 3. So going across the 3 row here, I see that 5.7 puts me in this range right here, which is to the left of our mark at which we uh, accept the hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So the question asked me to come up with the chi-square value. Uh, it said to give it in the nearest tenth, so before I finalize that answer, I want to make sure to uh, round that down to the nearest tenth, and I get 5.7 as my final answer. Number 10 is a graph analysis. We're given a graph showing us population size changing over time, uh, and it's simply asking us to calculate the mean rate of population growth, which is represented by individuals per day um, between days 3 and 7. To do this, simply going to think about um, the rate as being the change in the population divided by the change in time. And therefore, we end up with 1,000 minus 200, not 300, over uh, the change in days, which is 4 days. So we end up with 800 over 4. 200, it tells us to round to the nearest whole number, and there we go. Number 11 takes us back to Hardy-Weinberg. Uh, so our equation, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1, p plus q equals 1. Okay, 
here we have uh, uh, birds in the Galapagos. We have 24 that show a rare recessive condition. So it's 24 that's going to be uh, that fraction of the population is RQ squared. The other 63 show no beak defect. So they are either the homozygous dominant or the heterozygous individuals. Again, I have to present this or I have to start this problem by looking at the homozygous recessive. Uh, because I don't know whether those 63 are homozygous dominant or heterozygous. I don't know the combination of those two. So the fraction of the population that is homozygous recessive is going to be 24 out of a total, which is uh, 87. And that is going to be 0.28, and that's going to be equal to my Q squared value. Solving for Q, it's just going to be the square root of 0.28. My Q value then is equal to 0.53. And using this equation over here, if Q is 0.53, then P must be equal to 0.47. Now looking at the question to figure out which I need to solve for, it says, what is the frequency of the dominant allele? not asking me for the frequency of homozygous dominant. It's not asking me for the frequency of any particular genotype. It's actually asking for the allele, allele itself, which is from this second equation. And in this second equation, P represents the frequency of the dominant allele, and Q represents the frequency of the recessive allele. Therefore, I already have my answer. It's asking for P, because that is the frequency of the dominant allele, or 0.47. Question 13, we're looking at the rate of a reaction occurring over a certain amount of time and uh, a changing number of moles, except actually in this case the number of moles doesn't change, which makes the whole problem kind of easy. Um, an important thing to note when it says the word rate, what we're talking about is something over time, and therefore since we're given values for time and we're given the number of moles, basically we're looking at the change in moles over time, and change in moles over change in time. Uh, in this case, the, the moles don't change, so it's going to be zero in the numerator, which is giving away the answer here, but we'll finish it anyway, over a change of 20 seconds, giving us a rate of moles per second of zero. That is the answer. In number 14, we're looking at sordaria and uh, the formation of their spores. Over on the right-hand side, I have some diagrams to help out with this. Basically, we're looking for evidence of crossing over having occurred. In normal development with no crossing over, you would end up with a split in the two different uh, traits of these spores of light and dark. So the first two examples would show us basically uh, what it would look like if there was no crossing over. Now, when crossing over occurs, that can result in basically like two of these segments being swapped with two others. And so you could get a pattern like the next two, where you have light, dark, light, dark, or dark, light, dark, light. And in some cases, you could have a double crossover event, which would yield uh, the last two instances where uh, you had one swap occur and then another swap occur that leads to dark and then all the light ones and then more dark or light than all the black, uh, dark ones and then... Uh, light. Uh, it, for the best explanation of Sordaria, honestly, if you just Google Sordaria uh, crossing over and look at Google Images, you can find some really nice, concise diagrams that explain the whole process of how it comes to be these patterns. But for the sake of this question, all we have to do is uh, count up how many of these contain a spore arrangement that results from crossing over, which, as I said, is all of them except for the first two. And so we're just looking at 3 plus 4 plus 1 plus 2, or 10. 15 is a pretty quick question related to our transpiration lab. We're looking for the uh, number of stomata per centimeter squared. Um, the area is able to be determined by the 2 and 3 centimeter measurements here. Multiply those together for an area of 6 centimeters squared. And we're told there's 420 stomates. Um, all we have to do is the math here, and we end up with an answer of 70. Be careful because it does tell us to round that to the nearest tenth. So we do 70.0.
Number 17 isn't a terribly difficult problem, however it deals with a concept that we haven't gone into in super depth, which is water potential. I'll post a link to a Bozeman video that does a pretty good job explaining it. Um, what we're looking at here is a 100 milliliters of 2.5 molar salt solution in t at 25 degrees Celsius placed in a 250 milliliter beaker on a lab bench. And to solve uh, for the water potential, which is what we're being asked for, water potential is given by that fancy symbol. Uh, and the equation for it is the solute potential plus the pressure potential. We can simplify this right off the bat because by being in an open beaker, we know this is not a pressurized system, so there is no pressure potential. Therefore, we're just looking for the solute potential, which is given by the equation negative ICRT. And I'm going to solve this one piece at a time and explain what those pieces are. So we have negative. I is the ionization constant, which is given to us for salt as 2. C is the concentration, which is the 2.5 molar. 2.5. R is our uh, pressure constant. If you remember chemistry class, that's going to be 0 0.0831 where T is the temperature, and just to be a little bit more difficult, uh, that's temperature in Kelvin rather than degrees Celsius. So I have to add 273 to degrees Celsius in order to get Kelvin, and I get 298 when I add 273 and 25. And when I do this, I end up with a number which is negative 123, and it says nearest hundredth, which gives me negative 123.82. That would be my answer. You have to be careful about that negative. Um, if you don't have that, your answer is going to be marked or scored incorrectly. The negative basically tells us that uh, water from a higher value of water potential is going to flow towards this one, because basically the water will move towards a, uh, a lower value of water potential. So it should not come as a surprise that an extremely salty solution is going to have a particularly low value for the water potential or a a very negative value. Water will move towards that in many cases. Question number 18 I think was actually missing a piece of information that, that would be necessary in order to calculate the number of minutes. So I'm going to give you that piece of information and show you how we would use that. But basically we're looking at the uh, tip of an onion root, which is commonly uh, a commonly used example for uh, mitotically dividing cells just because that's at the region of a plant that's obviously growing. And uh, in this, five different microscope fields were counted uh, for the number of cells in each phase, and that was recorded in this table. The part where we're lacking some information is in our ability to calculate the number of minutes of the cell cycle that a particular phase is occurring. And the reason why we can't do that is because we don't know how long the entirety of this cell cycle is. However, just a little bit of internet research and uh, some trustingness on my part, it has told me that the uh, onion cell cycle takes 12 hours, or 720 minutes. Assuming that's true, and that is an assumption that we'll have to just make for this practice question. On the AP test, obviously, they would, if they wanted you to calculate the number of minutes, they're going to give you a specified amount of time that the cell cycle has occurred over. But assuming that this is true, then we just need to figure out what fraction of that time, of the 720 minutes, is spent in a particular phase. And we do that by taking the total number of cells in that particular phase divided by the total number of cells that were observed, which in this case is 107 cells. So which phase are we looking at? Well, let's see what the question says. We're looking for the phase of mitosis when the nuclear envelope fragments and the cell begins the processes that lead to eventual cell division, which is prophase. So for prophase, we have seven cells out of 107 total, which is going to give me 0 0.0654. And uh, so that's the fraction of the total amount of time that we're uh, going to estimate as being spent within prophase. Therefore, I'm going to multiply that by my 720 minutes to see what fra or what number of minutes uh, that's going to be, and it works out to be 47 minutes. And the question asks for the nearest whole number, so we're done.